All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us here on the Transportation and Logistics Podcast, powered by Atlanta Dispatch and Humble Bee Enterprises. I am excited to be here with a very, very special guest. We have Matthew Brockman, who is the Director of Drayage at Traffics. And before we begin, uh, this past weekend, for the very first time since the start of the pandemic, I stepped foot inside of my home church, which is Word of Faith, which is on the west side of Atlanta. And it felt great, my people. It felt amazing. Um, You know, I had gotten so accustomed to streaming just because of the whole COVID situation. And then once everything lacks, it was it was my my normal. So I just stayed streaming. But uh, it felt good to get back in and be in the house of the Lord. So my bishop is Bishop Bronner, who is of the uh, personal care products, you know, Bronner Brothers, uh, that whole enterprise that he's from that tree. And he was given biblical principles on the management of money. And I bring this up just to say, look, there are so many places where you can look and get better. You can you can learn from basically anybody. And, uh, you know, it's probably best to start now. Uh, if, if you had that idea that you wanted to improve in any place in your life, don't hesitate. Just do it. It was probably the right move in the first place. So uh, go after it 100%. And the Dispatcher's Guide to the Galaxy, which is the book I published, is available now. This bad boy is now available on Amazon. I was surprised to see that at first because my publisher said that, you know, there were too many of this, this type of genre um, <laughs> that they were sending over to Amazon. So Amazon was like, look, you know, hold it. Um, but, you know, that bad boy is on Amazon at this point and Apple books and, you know, all that stuff. But anyways, uh, I'm very excited to be here with this brother who is the director of Drayage at Traffics. And without further ado, Matt, my, my guy, how are you doing today, sir? Oh, I'm doing well. It's always a loaded question, though, in our industry, isn't that? Oh, 100%, man. If you're if you're not juggling two to three things in, uh, in the supply chain, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to figure out, I guess, what the next problem is, you know? Yeah. Um, yes, sir. But, um, yeah, so I'm the director of Drage Dra- Dra- Traffics. We're a 3PL. We're Canadian-based. Uh, and then we have about... 20 offices here on the U.S. side, um, and uh, I run the drayage for our team. We also have an intermodal department that's an arm of us, along with an Expedite, LTL, full truckload, and um, an IMC. So that's just a little bit on traffics, but Jory, uh, what specifically would you want me to kick off or start with? Look, man, you just you just said a mouthful right there. Let, well, let's let's reel it back a little bit, okay? Okay. Let's reel it back. <laughs> All right. So IMC. Uh, let's talk about what that is because you know I hope to bring on an IMC to talk about what they do specifically, and not too many people know what you guys do in the industry. So what is that? uh that acronym standing for and how does that play out in your and maybe not in your day-to-day um but just in the day-to-day of that intermodal team of yours okay yeah no so for our imc for traffics it allows our intermodal team it deals with only 53s it allows us to route things on the rail so we get rates from uh up canadian pacific cn um the rails and we load 53s we're able to schedule them uh unlike 20s and 40s uh forwarders or the customers whoever they how they set it up overseas they're the ones that are allowed to ra- uh, rail these loads. Um, so what I mean by that is sometimes customers reach out to us thinking that, you know, me or my team, we have the ability to route this from Chicago going down to Florida. That's not the case. That has to be set up overseas for 20s and 40s. Now, if it's for 53s, we're allowed to do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, why the specific on 53s when it comes to the IMC? Again, it has to do with the customs paperwork and how things are routed. So um, you, with the 53s, those are only moving domestically, right? Unless they're brand new boxes, you know, coming from India or China that are being built. That's how they get over here is by boat. But 53s are not moved internationally. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. And look, you also said that you are the director of drayage, but 
you made a, a clear distinction that you guys also have that intermodal department. You know, what is the line of delineation between those two? Um, because you, you kind of see yeah. them kind of cross-reference in certain ways. No, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, so for my team, we deal with the 20s and 40s, anything inland, uh, Canadian or U.S. port or rail. So um, any 20s and 40s, that's what my team touches. But we have the intermodal arm that does the drayage for 53s and then does most of the routing. So for customers that would rather, you know, consolidate freight or have the 20s and 40s at the ports transloaded and then for a cheaper price, instead of moving it full truckloads, you know, out of California when the rates were so high, they'd rather use the rail because it's not as hot. You know, they don't need a quick single driver on it. it they're, they're at the mercy of the rail, but it's cheaper. So it's more cost effective. Well, look, my guy, let's let's slow it down. I feel like we, we started out in, and you know, hot fire, hot fire. Look, brother, thank you so much for joining us here. The question that I like to start out with is how did you get into logistics? Because it's hard to, you know, you don't really hear too many people going to school for supply chain. You know, they just find it in a way. Um, that's, how did you get into logistics? Yeah, no, that's actually a, it's a great question. Cause that was something that I noticed. Um, when I first got to college, I saw that, you know, supply chain management was offered as a degree. And, uh, the way that it was pitched to me, it was, you get to work with people in a lot of different spaces, do, you know, kind of handling the transportation of goods across America or overseas. And I was like, okay, that that's catching my eye here. So the more I got into it, the more I enjoyed it. And just from, you know, having uh, some of our professors that brought in people that were currently in the industry, it just really caught my eye with, you know, how fast paced the industry is and it's not really boring. And for someone like me, I like working with a team. I like being able to talk or call people up and problem solve or come up with different solutions and then just working with people all over. It's, it's fun. You create this uh, network um, of people that, I mean, you're calling for, you know, a bunch of different things. If I don't know something or I can't answer something for our customer, I'm going to give a call to my carrier in that area. Or even if not in that area, at least they deal with similar, you know, rails, they can help me out. Um, So I started, uh, yeah, at Elmhurst, um, looking into supply chain there and then got my MBA at uh, St. Francis um, in supply chain as well. Um, And I got involved uh, in logistics at R. Donnelly doing LTL. So that was my first internship and where I started at. Um, From there, I went to Hub Group, handling their 53s. Uh, Did that for a while and then uh, Traffics hit me up and said, hey, we're starting our own, you know, uh, office uh, out here with a warehouse um, in Franklin Park. And we got some drivers and would you wanna take this on? And I never did anything with drivers. I never was a dispatcher, had no prior experience. And I just said, Yes, took the jump, um, joined Traffics. Uh, they've been around in Canada for about 40, 45 years and then just broke into the U.S. side in the past 10 years. So that's how that happened. And, uh, yeah, they started their own local drivers, uh, about 12 to 15 with a few in owner ops, um, doing local drage and local, uh, I wouldn't say OTR, but, um, yeah, about 250 to 300 miles around here. So I got to learn, you know, dispatching off of a notepad, sending their dispatches via their Gmails, and then trying to figure out all of the return locations, where to pull chassis from, where they can return them at the same or next day. Uh, It was a lot of trial by fire, but that's, I think, what gave me an appreciation for drivers and truckers and knowing what they're going through on a daily basis. And then by having our own drivers, I was able to actually throw on the hard hat and then go with them into some of the rails and see what they're doing, you know? not a lot of brokers, I believe, get that uh, firsthand experience of getting in a truck and feeling the weight of that container in the back as they're getting off on a ramp. And then just seeing how much labor goes into actually getting these containers secured, getting them off. And, you know, the problems that you can have, which is the pin number not working at some of these rails, even though if it is correct. And then going to the, the trouble, get, get a trouble ticket and speak to those guys. Just being able to see it all from A to Z was the biggest biggest impact on me um that i've just carried through from you know running the trucks to now creating a drage team uh of brokers here at traffics got you got you man so i I appreciate that and you know that's awesome that you studied for this bad boy and you were able to hit the ground running uh once you did get into the industry 
Um, you said you started with LTL, which is interesting because I recently saw a sales professional uh, post something on LinkedIn and they said in the last two years of Dre sales, they've learned way more about logistics than they had previously in their eight years of uh, <laughs> domestic LTL and full truckload sales. And, uh, you know, to you, you have both of these now. You have the LTL with, uh, you know, Donnelly, and then you went over to Hub Group and Traffics and you really, you know, blossomed there. Um, why do you think that is is drayage and dray sales that kind of teaches you more about the full of logistics? No, uh, it's a great question, Jory. And I mean, even to tie in full truckload, because I did do uh, coverage for that as well. Um, here is that you know the u.s is not a manufacturer we don't manufacture anything it's either being exported for what we do create and if we don't majority of it's coming from somewhere so to me the supply chain starts from when the containers arrive and as we saw during the pandemic how reliant we were on all these other countries for what they were manufacturing and how it was tough to even get the logistics process started so everything was bottlenecked at the ports and then it's trying to figure out okay what other logistics solutions can you come up with? So, I mean, yeah, you can import something at the L.A. port, but if it has to get to, you know, Nashville or New York and you're going all the way across the U.S., uh, it gets really expensive to dray something there just with how expensive uh, chassis charges can be. And per diem, per diem, I'm sure everybody's heard about and we can touch on later, but uh, the charges rack up very quickly in drayage. So for long hauls, it's just not the smartest move. So that's why people started looking to, you know, LTL or uh, full truckload or uh, intermodal as ways to kind of curb some of those costs that we were seeing the past two years. Gotcha, gotcha. You did just drop per diem. And that's one of those uh, pieces of jargon that is common in the drayage space, but not so much in domestic truckload. Uh, what is what is per diem? What is demurrage? What are those things and why do they have a place in the industry? Yeah. Um, so per diem, the way I like to describe it is rent on the box. So um, each customer, depending on what their contract is with the steamship line, <clears throat> can get a certain amount of days that are free before being charged. But as soon as that container is pulled from the port or rail, the clock starts. So you can get anywhere from three to five days on average free before they start charging you rent for it. So if you drop a box, you know, you pull it on Monday and then it's finally unloaded Thursday, but you're not able to return it until the following Monday, you're going to have a couple days of per diem on there, which it will take anywhere from the quickest I've seen is like a month and a half all the way up to, I mean, the height of pandemic, it was taking like six months, but on average, it's about one to three months, you'll receive that charge after from the steamship line, but it's technically attached to the carrier's um, MC. So when they pull it, they get sent the per diem. And that is just those days that the box was out that are not free. So they give you those three to five days and then you can get hit with anything after that you're paying rent for from the steamship line that's billed to the carrier, billed back to us and then billed to the customer. I know that this is something that is very, very, very high on the list of things that they want to get taken care of, which is, you know, a carrier is going to get that bill one to three months later, just like you said, and it's attached to their MC. And a lot of times there is not too much negotiation or too much that can be said about whatever is being charged. They just kind of have to accept whatever the steamship line is saying. Um, you know, how do you feel about that? Is there anything that you feel like we're, we're about to introduce that's going to make that easier or a more seamless or fair process? And if not, cool, you know, but that's that's what I'm interested in right there. Um, I believe that's what they're working on is for some of these customers that have routed things overseas is trying to get it billed to the customer directly. Um, some customers don't mind if there's, you know, a 10 or 12 percent uh, admin fee for paying it and getting it done for them but then we have a lot of customers who do have their own contracts who want to dispute and disputing takes a while but then that still sits on the carrier's account and um it takes a lot of follow-up just making sure that they're not shut out out of the port that they operate in every day because if they're shut out by one steamship line that means they're not pulling any of those boxes until that one per diem's paid so I hope to see something made where it's not just solely on the trucker if it's not their fault. You know, we've run some projects before where, you know, you're dropping 
50, 60 containers, especially in the height of the pandemic. There was not a bunch of warehousing space. So that people had to get creative and it was like, okay, well, let's use uh, containers as storage. And while that may work for some time, the charges that come from that are can be astronomical. Um, and it is quite the quite the bill to foot at the end of the day when you're looking at it and it's 60, 70, $100,000. And you're like, okay, maybe we could have found a more cheaper solution for this. But uh, to your point, I hope that there's something that does not have it fall solely on the carrier in the future, but also I want the steamship lines to be able to have a better system in order to invoice this quicker, just so that it isn't relying on, you know, the carrier once they get it coming back months later, and then we have to bring it up to the customer and the customer's like, oh, well, this happened so far back, like, it is valid. And that's kind of the game we have to play is this is valid. This was done because you guys wanted it dropped. You know what I mean? Um, this is at no fault of the carrier. And then just it, it the name of the game is CYA. You know, you're just covering your butt so that you can make sure that you have all the backup so that there's no discrepancies in uh, presenting that charge to the customer. CYA. That was the first thing I learned in dispatching. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was learning the, the ins and outs of dispatching uh, full truck loads, dry vans and, you know, domestic the first thing that they said is make sure you have that that email chain you know so you can always refer back to that bad boy when it comes to rates and all these other things and you know that's that's definitely the name of the game and uh you know to transition just a bit it's it's interesting that you say that you have to see why you have to cover your butt because in this next situation i wanted to discuss is kind of the agreeance the mutual understanding that you can't blame the other party for this and what i'm basically about to talk about is the force majeure and yeah. mm -hmm. if, you know the folks who never heard of the force majeure it's a very 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 common clause within a broker carry agreement and i'm paraphrasing of course uh but it refers to a mutual understanding that things sometimes are uncontrollable you know like acts of god or riots or something of that nature where you can't you didn't you can't predict it you can't control it and as a result you can't fault the other person um for not being able to do what they needed to do when that happens okay so i'm paraphrasing obviously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um now i bring that up there to say i don't know if these bad boys i'm about to mention count <laughs> but <laughs> the right the the bridge of the Americas in El Paso, Texas, is ceasing all commercial operations in an effort to process migrants that have been arriving in the region. And, you know, I don't know if you guys saw on Freight Waves and heard about it, uh, but there was also the Good Friday debacle at L.A. Long Beach where, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, nothing no containers were touched from Thursday evening all the way to Friday night because there was a, a union meeting and, you know, also the observance of Good Friday. Yep. And, you know, what are the ripples? You know, you you are in this world. What are the ripples of a situation like this? You know, that's a great question. I mean, for the one that's in El Paso, it's going to be a case by case basis with a customer, just because some customers tend to be like, OK, well, if that's not or if that's causing a hiccup in it, then, you know, provide me with a different solution. Some of them can be more understanding and say, OK, like, I understand we can accept, you know, additional charges from it. But it's it's it comes down to your relationship with the customer and then how you present it. You know, you can only lay out the facts and give, hey, this is a solution solutions that we have for it so much before it's just, hey, we there's there's no other option. If you want to look for someone else, I totally understand. Um, and then for the L.A. situation that happened with Good Friday, uh, that one was interesting because, you know, the port came back and said, oh, yeah, we'll give you appointments. I believe it was Sunday, Easter Sunday. They were saying, um, well, we'll open up appointments and extend it for just that day. But I mean, there's only a limited amount. There's already a shortage of laborers at the port of L.A. Um, how plausible is that going to be when you've pushed back, you know, two days of appointments and missed appointments trying to get everybody or whoever they can get to work on a Sunday at probably a premium price if they have to pay one of their drivers to come in? Um, that, that one was a sticky one, but we were actually able to 
you know, uh, we have contacts at the port or at these terminals and we reached out to them asking on Thursday and Friday, Hey, can we extend the LFD until Monday? And then we booked the first appointment. So that's how we got around. It was just getting the LFD extended saying, Hey, yes, we will definitely pick this up on Monday or Tuesday. Just please extend it till then. And that's how we got around that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's a, a blessing that you guys had the, the wherewithal to hit them up immediately and get those early, early appointments. Um, you know, like who foots those bills, you know, when things like that happen, who do you pass the bills to? Oh, in regards to like, uh, the situation on good Friday or just yeah, yeah. anything that really changes what the original schedule was, we can use the, uh, good Friday, uh, you know, example, just because, you know, it's very specific, but you know, when things like this happen, where where do those charges go because and i'll say i'll preface i'll season the question with this uh it was said that some of the some of the things that needed to get shipped out were produce and it ended up costing more to you know to actually ship it out than it would have made because of those type of delays like yeah where do those costs go because they you know they got to go somewhere yeah, those costs are being pushed back to either the broker or the customer and ones where the carrier just isn't able to, uh, you know, come or be able to perform their job. Like if they're not able to get into the port, they're not able to pull them. You can't really fault them for that. I know the truckers get beat up quite a bit for whenever, you know, something is not picked up on time or delivered. But I mean, those guys are dealing with quite a bit. So it's trying to be, you know, understanding of that. But for example, for the one for Good Friday, like if you were able to, you know, be ahead of the curve and ex- ask uh, the terminals or your port representative for extended LFDs or reach out to the steamship line, they'll definitely help you, but you have to make that request. You can't wait for, you know, Sunday to roll around when they already advised, hey, you got to get appointments set up for Monday, Tuesday. And if you haven't done that, then uh, you're going to be paying um, demurrage. And I know that kind of comes back to what you were saying before, but demurrage is just storage at a port or a rail. They just give it a fancy name, you know, just to change things up. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, to your point, it's going to be the customer that foots the bill unless the carrier is the one who made the mistake. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, look, man, you've been doing this for quite some time now. I mean, so much so that you worked your way up to uh, director of drayage. Uh, at this point, do you have a, a preference on which port of entry your customer's freight enters or exits the U.S.? Like, uh you know, what's the port that you've never had an issue? And like, what's the port that you just pray it doesn't have to go through? (laughs) Um, Well, during the pandemic, it was LA that I didn't want it to have it to go through. Um, uh, I would say right now, the port that's operating most efficiently and that I like to deal with is Port of Baltimore. They give quite a few days that are pretty healthy. Um, I mean, we had some loads arrive uh, yesterday and the LFD is 426. Usually the LFD at any other port would be 420, you know, at the most, um, giving you an extra day. So uh, Port of Baltimore just has done a really great job the past couple of years of ramping everything up and making sure they're fully staffed and not many problems. Um, but also Savannah is a good one for us. And then same with uh, New York, New Jersey. Uh, New York, New Jersey has overtaken LA as the most uh, busiest port, but they are also handling that pretty well. Um, and then less fees. I'm sure you heard about the CTF and Pier Pass out of LA, which has also turned off customers um, just because there's extra cost to uh, import your container. Right, right, right. Well, no, I love it, man. I, I appreciate you for giving us some of the industry insights there. And just to throw this out there, I have seven trucks out of Baltimore with about 30 chassis, privately owned chassis. Let's talk after. Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, no, that's awesome, man. Um, it, I guess just sticking with some of this industry news, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you have heard and talked about, kicked around the uh, 2M Alliance and how that's going to be breaking up in 2025. Uh, for those who have not, heard about the 2M Alliance. Uh, That's basically some shipping juggernauts who came up with a a shared vessel, uh, a vessel sharing agreement back in 2015. So that's Maersk and MSC. Um, They're they're not going to renew that agreement. 
which is really going to shake up a lot of the routes that have already been uh, put into place, a lot of things that people are used to. Um, you think that's going to have a huge impact on your customers? Um, it's it's going to depend because uh, I guess it would depend or we'll have to see what the costs are from it. Like you were saying with the different um, stops or routes that they're going to be taking, I don't know if it's going to increase the cost. I, I mean, it shouldn't from what I've seen. But at the same time, I don't know how it's going to disrupt the market with how they're shipping with uh, these big juggernauts that have been working together for the past. Um, I don't even know how long, but uh, that's going to be more for the international people to, uh, I guess, discuss when they're talking about um, moving containers inland over here. Uh, but I can't wait to see how it plays out overall and how that affects us and how we're going to have to adapt to working with these two different juggernauts a little bit more separately, though. Right, right, right. Nah, man, it's, it's going to be interesting for sure. Um, but, you know, once you find out that your interests uh, no longer align, it's, it's cool to, you know, to separate amicably because that's what I feel yep. like this is. You know, uh, they, they adhere to the rules. They said, we're, we're going to let you know two years ahead of time. And, you know, it seems like everybody is a OK with the situation. So, um I don't see anything wrong with what they're doing at all. Yeah, no, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I have heard rumblings of Marisk uh, also increasing their um, their footprint with uh, assets on the drage side. So I'm interested to see what that's going to turn out um, on their end, but that's just something to keep an eye on in the next year. Definitely, definitely. I agree. And I believe I heard those same things, brother, you know, uh, which kind of brings me to this question. <laughs> you know, look, Freight Waves is my source. I mess with Freight Waves. I'm always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always on the website. I listen to it kind of on a daily basis when I'm at the gym. And, you know, but my question to you is, how do you stay up to date on changes in the container shipping industry? And, uh, you know, what steps do you take to adapt your business to these changes? So so what are you doing on a daily basis to, you know, really stay up to date? Like you said, freight waves, and then it's um, finger on the pulse with a lot of these carriers. Some of them have their own newsletters, and I like to hear it from the people that are boots on the ground, you know, dealing with this every day. I mean, I like to say that I'm dealing with it every day, but I'm not getting that first-person view on how things are going. So on Mondays, it's a lot of... Uh, calls in the morning just trying to see if there's any changes this week if there's anything i should be aware of um things that are going on in the industry like one of our uh, carrier partners that's a national carrier um is currently working on the uh owner operator um bill i'm sure you've seen that in california how they stopped allowing owner, owner operators and they're trying to make that a national thing um but that's where I get a lot of my uh, information from. It's just from my truckers. You know, they're dealing with it all the time. They're going to be the first one that hears about if there's a change or if there's a new uh, port fee going into place. Uh, they hear about it right away. And that's that's what I'd say is the best is just talk to your carriers, you know, have a more uh, personal relationship with them. It's just it's, it'll only help you in the long run. Um, all right. Yeah. OK, no, perfect. I mean, I agree. Uh, it's definitely going to be uh, more specific when you're talking to the people who are living yep. it every single day, you know, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. for the, uh, my bad. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah. just ask to see if some of them have newsletters, you know, they usually have, uh, with nowadays with social media, a lot of these companies have started getting social media managers or people to post, you know, weekly updates. And if you can get on an emailing list for that, it just helps kind of shed a light on things that are going at least from their perspective and what their take is on it. So that was all. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, you know, have you noticed any trends in the types of goods that are being imported or exported through your services? And uh, do you expect any changes in these trends in the near future? Um, I would say the one thing that has been sticking out to me a lot in the past year is solar panels. That has been a big uh, commodity. And then also like tier one auto. I've seen quite a bit. Food and beverages always comes and goes and picks up, you know, just depending on if it's produce season or shortages. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd probably the number one I'd say right now is solar panels. Okay. I mean, and I'm not surprised about that either. I mean, uh, no. we're talking about reducing the footprint. Everybody's going green, you know, definitely solar panels. Why not? Especially if you can even sell some of that energy back to the, the power company. Yep. Uh, you know, that's, I think that's a, a great option. 
what what's tier one autos? What does that uh, really refer to? Uh, just like the the main uh, the main auto manufacturers that you know here. You know what I mean in the U.S. Okay. Uh, yeah, all the big brand names. That's what I mean by tier one. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no worries, no worries. You know, the funny thing is, I like to break down the jargon so that everybody can get an understanding <laughs> and, uh, you know, then implement it because yep. <laughs> that's the, that's the right. whole point about the industry is, you know, you got to be able to talk the talk if you're trying to grow in it. No, 100%. And um, I think the one thing that people do get uh, nervous about, like uh, you're talking about in the drage industry, there's a lot of acronyms, there's a lot of uh, different ways to say things, but if you're going to take a stab at it, just talk to your carriers, you know, trust what they're telling you and ask questions. I mean, that, that's all you have to do. It's going to be trial by fire. But the more that you do that and the more that you kind of struggle your way through it, drage will become easier. And then you'll see maybe in a month or two months, like things will just start clicking. And then you'll wonder how you even learned it. You know, it just becomes second nature. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, I did have this question, which is, you know, we have the Amazons of the world and we have Walmart even competing to, to be able to provide that same home delivery service. Um, those are kind of deemed the final mile. Why is Dre is dubbed the first mile? Uh, Cause that's where it's uh, coming in at usually is uh, the port and then getting put on the rail, going to whatever final destination it is like Chicago, for example, it's a big freight hub and, Everything is coming from all over the U.S. So whether it comes into Baltimore, Savannah, Houston, L.A., or Tacoma, it's got to work its way some way. And the cheapest is the rail. So it's the first time it's getting touched, you know what I mean, inland. So that's why I think they call it the, the first mile. Okay. So one, let's just say once something does uh, get to the uh, Chicago market, fresh from the mail, I mean, from, oh, I said from the mail, <laughs> fresh <laughs> from the rail. Is yeah. that then that next person that touches it to, you know, move that 53, um, is that then still considered drayage or is that now specifically intermodal? Yeah. So if it's, uh, if it's a 20 and 40 moving down the rail, it's still considered drayage. If it's a 53 footer being, uh, pulled off the rail in Chicago, getting loaded from, you know, going from Jacksonville to Chicago, just say if it's a 53 and it's getting, uh, delivered to Franklin park over here or something, um, that's considered drage as well. They just call Dre anything with a container that's being pulled or delivered drage. Um, and that's where it gets a little bit fuzzy with intermodal because then intermodal is usually referring to being able to route 53s on the rail. They don't usually call twenties and forties, uh, intermodal because you're not allowed to route that, uh, domestically does that make sense sorry yeah, no, no, okay no, no. okay <laughs> no, no i'm hard. like i know i forget sometimes i'm like okay i gotta gotta slow myself down there but um <laughs> yeah so that's uh that's pretty much it so yeah the final the final mile would also be the uh the drage in chicago it's probably going to end up there locally so it, it would be the first and final mile technically um unless you get to and usually the port transfers it over onto the rail right there. So you don't have to do anything, but uh, you can do that. Or there's rail to rail from one different one in Chicago to another one. And they call that a cross town. Um, just some other fun jargon words for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, look, consumers and manufacturers want visibility every second of the trip these days. Yep. Um, are there any new technologies or, uh, digital tools that you guys are considering implementing into your operation to kind of like make sure that they're able to do that? Or are you already utilizing any platforms that give that 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 granular visibility that they're asking for? Yeah. So for on the OTR side, we have like, you know, Project 44, um, some of our other ones that, you know, track the driver's phone. Some carriers have started implementing in their ELDs, uh, GPS or, some, or Samsara links that show where the driver is every step of the way, every second, you can see every time he moves an inch. Um, and those ones are great just for guys that are doing a lot of weekend tracking, things like that, or if it's really hot. But um, we've also it, put in some of our freight, like when we're pulling from uh, Tacoma and then transloading it and then having it go all the way to Ohio for you know auto parts. Um, and it's important, needs, visibility for some of our tier one customers that I was talking about. They need visibility all the time to know when they can plan their 
uh, capacity for when it's going to be coming in, if a line's going to be shut down. So we have some devices that we can attach uh, after transloading that just stick right onto the last pallet that uh, tells exactly where it is, how fast the freight's moving. If there's been any major stops, it shows the major stops are like braking. If the driver braked really hard, it shows that uh, along the way and then gives you alerts. So if you know this isn't supposed to be opened at all, it's not supposed to be touched after the transload, there's also a sensor on there to let it know, hey, light was detected, there shouldn't be any light. That means somebody's trying to either open it or you know, move things around that they shouldn't be. Um, it also keeps track of the temperature and then it can be reused, but they are expensive. But for, you know, important customers, you want to make sure you're giving them full visibility and full confidence in everything you're doing. It's just things like that, that, uh, separate yourselves, you know, from others. But, um, yeah, sorry, Joy, I'll let you ask any questions you got on that. Oh, no, that was great. I mean, that seems like a very, very nifty piece of equipment it does sound very expensive, but that's exactly what, uh, you know, a manufacturer or a shipper a customer wants to hear uh, their broker be able to say that, hey, I can I can guarantee you I can tell you anything that's happening uh, with your freight throughout the entire time, especially in the in the, the final stages. Now, that's amazing, brother. Yeah, no. And uh, some of these ones, too, are pretty cool where it allows you to share the login. So like we've shared our login with the customer to be like, hey, full transparency, nothing funny's going on. This is where your stuff is. So anytime they want to know, instead of having to reach out, they can just hop online and be like, OK. And then we just label it, you know, whatever product was in that container, container number, put it right there so that they know exactly where that container or that trailer. But the container product is at any time. But uh, yeah, it's great. It's a it's a really great tool. I love it. I, I recommend it anytime to some of our larger customers like if you want this tracked if you want to know where it is and you are very concerned about you know your freight being stolen anything use this and just let us know uh but yeah okay 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 well, look i'm going to make a, a a little shift right now and this is really going to be speaking to a lot of even my customers and other draymen uh that are in this market you know i've i've hosted these sessions way back when the golden age of trucking was here and i, I had this session called um uh, what did i call it oh man uh it was the gold rush it was something that had to do with containers i forgot what i was calling it but anyways it was basically there was a lot of money in drays and uh draymen were making so much money that they didn't know what to do with themselves but that is not the case. This hasn't been the case for the last year and a half. And capacity uh, is everywhere. And the actual Dre moves are, I'm not going to say non-existence, but they're they are very, very slim. You know, they're, they're not as readily available as they once were. You know, what would you say to a motor carrier that specializes in Dreish to do today in order to make themselves marketable for an organization like yours um, to get first dibs on some some high volume projects that might be coming up. Yeah, um, to your point with that, it would be uh, just reaching out to some of these brokers or customers direct and having a conversation with them. Um, a lot of these people want to know that they're taken care of and that their freight is going to be serviced. Um, some of the things I've seen recently from customers is, hey, uh, a couple months ago, it was all price, price, price. Let's see how low it can get. Now, some of the customers are realizing, OK, maybe price isn't everything because it's tough for drivers to stay with the company if they're not getting paid well. So it, it, it hurts them. So on my end, uh, what I do with our carriers is, you know, give me your price. I'm going to go back to the customer. I'm going to get some feedback. And then if I have to ask them to come down again in order to win the freight, it, it's a it's a team game. You know, we're a broker as well. We need the loads. But then I can't move anything without my partners. So there has to be a trust between us of, OK, this is what I have or this is what you got. And what can we do in order to make this a win-win for both parties? So I would just encourage carriers who are reaching out just to be like, hey, can I have a phone conversation just to talk about what your current business is? What lanes are you guys running? What would fit well with my guys or what we run consistently? Um, some places have to be already set up with or be on their portal in order to schedule appointments. And that just puts you ahead of other carriers that don't have that capability. Uh, a lot of customers too right now, depending on who it is, want final charges and PODs within 48 hours. And that's 
sometimes tougher for other carriers, depending on when their drivers turn in paperwork compared to ones that have, you know, ELDs or um, technology equipped in their trucks or to their phones where they can upload some of that stuff much faster. And it, in the end, it just, it's all about the customer's experience. You know, they want as little problems for great service and also want a cheap price. And sometimes I tell them, you know, you're not going to get all three. So I'm like at, at traffics, we're not going to be the most expensive, but we're also not going to be the cheapest, but it, your stuff will be serviced accordingly. Um, hopefully I answered that for you, Jory. No, you definitely did. You definitely did. I mean, I mean, it, it really is. Uh, about having the relationship between the carrier and the broker, the carrier understanding that rates aren't where they used to be, and uh, you know the and the broker understanding that expenses, operating expenses are higher than they've ever been. So yep. you know just how that balance, uh, you know how to balance that to make sure that everybody can. Uh, survive while rates are at this place and, uh, you know, I guess develop that relationship so that when volume returns, um, you know, everybody's already on in great standings from the work we've already done together. Um, yeah. How is it for you? Are you are you on the pricing side of things with customers? Like, or is that like a, a, a completely separate role within the organization? No, no, I'm on uh, discovery calls with customers to find out, you know, what they're pain points are, what's the problems they're having, if they are having any problems, if we would be a good fit. You know, sometimes I'm on there just to go over some of their invoices they've gotten just to be like, hey, is this accurate or am I being overcharged? Um, wear many different hats here. And to your last point that you just said, Jory, about volume, that's probably the biggest name of the game right now. If you have volume, carriers are more than happy to you know, work with you on the pricing or even drop their pricing because that's keeping their guys busy every single day. And they're able to keep dispatching stuff to them to keep, you know, the lights on. And yes, they did make a good amount of money the past two years, but now that it's come back down, it's, you know, they're trying to also uh, keep putting food on the table. So I'm like, if you got anything with volume, that is your best bet with carriers um, to sell to them. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I was just I was like, no, you hit it on the head with the volume. I mean, that's what we're always asking just because it helps push the price. But I tell our carriers too, hey, I'm not here to break your arm. I just want to know where we can be at so that we're both happy. You know, so what I tell them, like, give me a price that makes you happy, but will also be aggressive enough to help us win. Because I'm sure everybody sees the requests all the time of, hey, give me your best rate. Give me your best rate. I mean, carriers are not purposely giving you their worst rate. But there has to be a little bit more of a conversation than just give me the cheapest one, you know? So Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I agree. And I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I, get, I, I get hit up for quotes every single day. And I don't remember the last time I just gave a blanket quote without saying, uh, what's your target? Because at this point, exactly. you mm -hmm. know, you got to have that target um, just because rates are so different between what a carrier might have you know, been conditioned to say because things were so high versus where they are. So I'd rather just skip that back and forth and just say, hey, where do you need to be so that we can make sure that this, yes. this you know, has some type of profitability and we can partner on this bad boy. So that's that's been my my style for the last little bit. A hundred percent. Yeah. No, I mean, that's another great point is asking for targets because that just really gives you a at least a place to start with, you know, if you can get volume targets and then the details that uh, you're golden, you got everything you need. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, look, I appreciate you. And, uh, you know, when you, when you took your trip to Ireland, did you, did you happen to see any steamships? Did you see any containers? <laughs> I actually had to take a walk by the Dublin port because just me being a container guy, I got so excited. Just, um, it was my first international trip and being able to, feel i guess in a in a goofy way uh connected you know what i mean to the rest of the world and when i see a 20 or 40 footer that looks the exact same as a 20 or 40 foot in the u.s just knowing that that could go anywhere and that it's something that's standardized across the world is is really cool it's it's something else so i definitely have a, a little bit extra appreciation for what we do um but yeah 
Ireland was uh, great, but it was cool to see that. I definitely have to look around at the trucks when I'm over there. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel it, brother. I feel it. Well, look, man, I love the fact that you were able to get that experience. You know, I probably had my moments similar and, you know, just in different ways, but not. I, I love the fact that it does bring you uh, back to we are all connected in this world. So, um, brother, man, that's that's it. That's what I had. Did you have anything that you wanted to share that we didn't touch on? Maybe something, you know, anything? Um, I mean, not really. I can tell you how it, our, our process or how our teams are broken up here if you're anything interested on how we do or handle our dredge. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I have uh, me that oversees the drainage department, but then we also have an AM team, and then we have a carrier sales team. So our carrier sales team, they are strictly broken up by zones, and they are quoting um, in their respective zones. So how they get it is we'll get a quote in, I'll assign them to it, they'll quote it out. If we win it, that's great. Then they dispatch it, get it all sent up, make sure that the carrier receives it and can pass that off to the AM team. And then our AMs for that are assigned to those reps, jump on it and then they, uh, you know, ask the carrier, hey, this is coming available in two days. When do you wanna pull and deliver? What do you wanna do? And get that all set up and handle all the communication from A to Z. And then once they get that, then they hand it to the customer team with the finished final paperwork and final charges, and then they give it to the customer. So um, it's just something that's take, it's taken quite a while because it's grown from just me to about, you know, 20 people on the team now. So I was doing cradle to grave. So to see this broken up nicely where people aren't overwhelmed and where it all gels nice is something that I take pride in. So, um, yeah, that's why I just had to mention that. I'm like, I, I know that I'm the director, but it's I have a whole entire team of people that constantly bust their butt for me and are making sure our carriers are taken care of and just doing things the right way so that, you know, everybody's happy at the end of the day. Because what I always say is, you know, we got to do this again tomorrow. So we need to have a great relationship, right? So when the hard conversations come up, we have those uh, partners with us that are more than happy to help us out. My guy, congratulations, because if there's anything that I understand uh, the value of is building a team so that you don't have to do everything, you know, and yeah. the fact that you've been able to get this bad boy built out to uh, multi levels, everybody has their clear understanding of their role and you get to sit back. Well, not sit back because you're in, it, <laughs> but you get to advise and, you know, work the role of, building people up versus having to be you know in the weeds every second uh congratulations no thank you and i mean it's it's i don't uh you know how it is it's uh i don't i don't like the term boss or anything like that it's a it's a leader you know i would never ask some of my people to do something that i wouldn't do myself and some of the people i've been working with have more experience for me and i go to them um i might just be better at handling people better you know something along those lines but uh yeah it's it's traffics were fully remote now so when we did the uh drainage brokerage it was a lot easier i'd say to find good talent because trying to find somebody in chicago that only you know works with chicago rails that's great but when we're working across the u.s you need professionals that have worked out of tacoma or la or new york so that's also helped me build quite the superstar team with people with many years of experience because uh we're able to work from wherever got some people internationally uh things like that but i'm, I'm very blessed for the team that i have and it's nice when people come in excited every single day with that same uh energy that i have and they're like okay well what can we do how can i help each other it's uh it's it, it makes me very proud. That's uh, that's what I'll say. It sounds like a team, man. How how'd you where'd you build that team leadership type of uh, mentality? Where'd you where'd you nurture those skills and those muscles? Uh, sports. Uh, I played football in college and while I was getting my MBA and you work with a lot of people from all different uh, economic backgrounds, you know, whole bunch of different cultures. And it just gives you the appreciation especially whether you're the youngest guy or the oldest um you know everybody's at different stages in their life and if you treat people a little bit more like people and not just the number or an employee and you take care in their lives or just care as them as a person you, you'll be amazed at people that go above and beyond i mean 
there's no, there's no shame and, you know, people that clock off right away, but if we have problems or we have something that needs a little bit more attention, just the willingness of people to stick around a little bit longer, um, or longer because we're at home or because they care, it's makes me happy knowing that I'm doing the right things. Obviously I don't want to sit here till six, seven o'clock every night, but when those problems do arise, knowing that I'm not by myself and people are bought in the same way as I am, it, it's great. And it just comes, I think from, you know, everybody, has had a bad manager or boss at some point. And me being a younger person, it's trying not to, you know, pretend like I know everything or rub people the wrong way, but also at the same time demand some of that respect. And we've just found a really good groove and just great people here. You know, um, obviously people need corrections here and there, but it's, uh, it's a team of people that actually care about each other. You know, if somebody has got to step out and go do something or take care of their kid, there's three other people that are more than willing to jump on something so that they can go do that. I love it, my guy. I love it. I love it. And, uh, you know, the, the, this is the craziest part. People, uh, you know, this is how I got introduced to this team. I went to a networking event. I'm on the board with the Atlanta Logistics Council, you know, connection, excuse me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm on the board. I do a lot of volunteering with them. And I was just making my rounds away one one of these sessions, um, and I just ran into one of your team members, and it was like the conversations flowed so seamlessly. I recognized so many synergies, and you know, it was just like everything was melting together. Just like, oh, we have to follow up. We have to have another conversation. Um, so, it, you know, from the from the the. I really like your team. I'm just going to say that. Um, and it seems like you guys are building something pretty special. So if there's anything that I can do uh, to support and highlight and all that kind of jazz, uh, I'm happy to do it. So, uh, I again, I appreciate you so much for joining me on the stage tonight, brother. No, thank you, Joy, for having me and just giving me a little bit of a platform to, you know, speak on this just with uh, – being able to talk to some of my carriage lately and let them know, you know what I mean? Things like this. And then hearing the nice feedback, it's just the biggest thing I can tell people is if you want great rates and you want great service, you, you got to create a great relationship. Um, you you got to just call your carrier, check up with them, you know, ask them what's going on, just shoot the crap with them for a little bit, but then they'll get to work for you and then they'll do things and go above and beyond more than you ever could dream. It's just, Seriously, just take care of your truckers and they will go above and beyond for you. I can't I can't say it enough. I work with some really great people and have had the luxury of having some of these great relationships now for the past couple of years where now I'm hanging with them, going to Cubs games, things like that. And it's like, you know, to have a great relationship with so many different people. And, you know, I've even had my carriers in the same area help each other out if they're having problem on a load or they don't have plugins, you know we're all in this together like you said before it's it's never going to be able to do something by yourself but to have people that care and genuinely want to make things better make things run smooth it it, it takes a relationship so that that's what i'll just end it with um uh, yeah yes sir yes sir I'm like uh, before i go off again jory sorry <laughs> <laughs> well again i appreciate you brother and for everybody else that is tuning in uh, thank you for the support. As always, you know, this bad, this club, this transportation and logistics club house started because I was in corporate America and I was dispatching and my truck drivers had gotten fired and I didn't want to get fired. So I said, hey, how can I learn how to do something else to make some money? And I found out that people were dispatching as independent dispatch agents in this stage. I, I learned how to transition by interviewing people who were doing it already. And, um, you know, it's, it's grown just from that. It's not, it's no longer just me, uh, being able to benefit from the questions that are asked on stage. Um, you know, we've grown to almost 29,000 members. So, wow. you, know, you know, with that being said, I'm, I'm very excited to continue to have these discussions and on Wednesday, we are going to be bringing in, I believe, the VP of Business Development for the brand new. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's called Repower. Have you ever heard of Repower? I have not. It's like a coupe. 
uh, by Ryder or okay. it's like a V yeah. hub, you know. So if you got mm-hmm. super, if you got a lot of trailers and they're in a spot and they're not being utilized, you can you can leverage this platform to to make some money with it. So we're going to be talking with those brothers because they're very new. They're very new and they just got a brand new round of funding for about eight million dollars so i think that they got some buy-in people really like what they have going on so uh tune in on wednesday uh 7 p.m eastern standard time here and we're going to be discussing that um and always on mondays 7 30 a.m eastern standard time as we are uh partnered up with freightway sonar team we haven't identified our brokerage that's going to be joining us on monday um but you know i'll let that be known as soon as we do so i appreciate you again uh matt and you have a blessed day brother all right thank you joy appreciate you having me on and if you have any questions or anybody else that want to shoot you you know anything oh, yeah, yeah, my, bad, side. my bad my bad <clears throat> how can people reach you <laughs> <laughs> uh you can reach out to me on linkedin or shoot me an email um at mbrockman at traffics.com I'm um, sure I could uh, spell it out too. It's B R A C H M A N N. So M Brockman at traffics.com. But yeah, feel free to reach out for anything, whether it's you just want to know how it works on the broker side or you need help with something. More than happy. Uh, like Jory said, you know, this is just to help educate people, get people excited in the logistics industry and talk things that we know about. So when other people look at us, it's not at, like a crazy look, you know. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Jory. I appreciate this. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you again, and everybody, be blessed.